Jingle bell, 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 I hope you guys are having an amazing day today. Hello and welcome to Glomus. Specifically, I believe this is Christmas Eve Glomus. So Merry Christmas Eve and Merry Glomus. Today's candle of the day is a butter rum eggnog from Bath and Body Works. Again, I got a bunch of stuff on candle day that are like my Christmas candles. And this one I've been really enjoying. I've been burning this the past probably five hours. Um, <laughs> just because I was doing stuff in the office. And I've been really enjoying the sun. I think it's really fun, very Christmassy. Um, today's video, we are doing something I'm so excited about. This has probably been since I started this whole evolution of series and I talked about wanting to deep dive into brands. This brand has definitely been one of the most requested. There's a few that are like, people very clearly want me to talk about it. And that brand is Too Faced Cosmetics. For this video, I actually decided to enlist the help of another YouTuber who does some amazing awesome deep dives on her channel as well, and that is LS here on YouTube. Elle does a lot of videos similar to mine of the evolution of videos, but she definitely heavily focuses on brands more than I do, where I more focus on like people. So her and I were talking about it, and because she does so much research on these brands in general, we decided to actually kind of split up this evolution of. So Elle is going to be talking about Too Faced from basically its inception in 1998 up until about 2012, and then I am taking over from about 2012 onward. I think because this is a brand with such a long history and a long list of like product releases, scandals, dramas, like all of that, I think that it's kind of a good thing to split up something like this. So uh, go check out Elle's video after this one or before this one if you want kind of like the tea on what happened before 2012. And if you want to see what happened after 2012, keep watching mine. Also this video is sponsored, so I'm gonna roll my little sponsorship, but this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. They are working with me again and again. I am so, so excited because this is a service that I use in my day-to-day -day life. We get the weekly boxes, so it's very cool to be sponsored by brands that I actually love. So roll the sponsorship. <laughs> Okay, so we are back with another fun and fresh HelloFresh sponsorship, and today we are making beef ragu spaghetti. Okay, can I just say, Charles and I, when quarantine first started, we knew we were going to be eating in a lot more, and we just decided to try out HelloFresh at the recommendation of some of our friends, and it has easily been one of the best decisions we've ever made. This is what we're making. Easily my favorite thing about HelloFresh is how delicious all of the meals are. Like, we have been consistently getting it now for the the past since about March. So we've been getting it for a few months now. And every single time the food is such good quality, so yummy. All of the ingredients are incredibly fresh and taste absolutely delicious. I think one of the biggest barriers to making food at home is honestly just the time commitment. It always feels like you have to grab a bunch of things, find a recipe, figure out what you're going to do, cook everything, make everything together. HelloFresh makes it so easy. Everything comes in one little brown bag. It has the exact amount of ingredients you need. And usually the meals take anywhere between 20 to 25 minutes. So it really fits perfectly into anybody's time frame or lifestyle. Not only is the food delicious, but HelloFresh has a huge focus on sustainability. So the packaging that it comes in is recyclable. And because you're getting the exact portion size that you need for this meal, you reduce your food waste by up to 25%, which is one of my favorite things because I absolutely hate buying fresh veggies and fresh fruit and knowing that they're just going to go to waste. If you're interested in trying, you can use code SMOKYGLOW80 to get 80 off your first five HelloFresh boxes, including free shipping on your first box. I love HelloFresh and I would 10 out of 10 recommend. It's actually really good. Go check out HelloFresh. Click the link in my description down below and use code SMOKYGLOW80. So without further ado, let's get right into it. I would say starting in 2012, right? Too Faced was definitely a very popular brand. Like they had built up a pretty solid reputation. They were known for kind of these cutesy, more gimmicky styles of makeup. And they were definitely popular during this time, especially given that makeup in general was not necessarily as popular as it is today. I think we all can kind of agree that around the 2014 mark, the sort of makeup bubble, as I like to call it, started growing. And that was because of a lot of reasons. But I think a driving force was 
was that beauty YouTube content started getting a lot more popular during this time. So in 2012, uh, Too Faced started off by launching their Naturally Sexy palette, muted, neutral, cool tone palette, and to me it kind of seemed like their response to the craze around the Urban Decay Naked palettes. They also put out their Summer Eye palette, which actually was very cute for 2012. Like, yes, it's kind of boring and just has a couple pastel-y pops of color, but for 2012, this palette is actually really cute. The concept's cute. It was kind of basic standard Too Faced. Like, they had a cute concept, they did some cute graphic artwork on the front, and then they executed it decently with the color story. Now, in this video, I'm going to be talking at nauseum about the Too Faced holiday collections that they came out with, but that's really mainly because I think that these holiday collections were really big for the brand. These holiday collections were super, super hyped up, and definitely for a long time, especially in 2012, these were kind of collector's editions, like collectibles. And also something interesting about Too Faced that's not this way with other brands is that they don't just have one holiday collection come out. They have a bunch of different holiday collections that come with a bunch of different variations that are sold in different places. So for example, some are only sold at Ulta, some are only sold at Sephora, some are only sold at QVC. So kind of in the way that you'll see, the best example I could think of was Taylor Swift will come out with a new album and she'll have all these different versions of the album that are like slightly different. And so all of her diehard fans will go and buy every single version of that album because they want to number one support her, but also they want that version because they're a stan. Too Faced was definitely playing on the fact that they had these sort of stands that like really loved and collected these holiday collections. So they kind of milked it for everything that it was worth. Like this holiday collection, the 2012 one, they had the Sweet Indulgence palette, which was at a $54 price point. It was the Sephora exclusive. And it basically had a pan that popped out and revealed like face palettes and mascaras. Very Tarte, what we see from Tarte now. It seems like based on the blog posts that I've read about this palette in particular, Too Faced still at this point in time had a very consistent formula that was very well loved in the makeup community. So this palette got very good reviews. And it's the same thing with the All Hail the Queen palette, which was their kind of second holiday palette of 2012. This palette had like a built-in uh, mascara, a built-in eye primer. And even though the two palettes frankly look so similar, like one just has a green and one doesn't, the palettes look ridiculously similar. Both of them got a lot of praise during the time and were kind of seen as these like collector's edition Too Faced palettes. Can I just say, the fact that I and a lot of other people absolutely fell into the mindset of like, I feel like I could do a whole video on this of just like of makeup collecting in general. Like I feel like I totally fell into that trap and so did a lot of other people that like we could collect stuff that's gonna go bad. Anyway, it's basically these holiday palettes. You're going to see a lot of holiday palettes from Too Faced in this video and these ones are very representative of what they all look like. Very little variation, very new neutral, very basic, but also in, in turn incredibly easy to market because there's such a wide audience that would like palettes like this. I think 2013 was an interesting year for the brand because I think it was sort of, they went through a mild rebranding phase. So this is when Too Faced started coming out with those nine pan tin palettes that became huge. They don't sell them anymore. They kind of discontinued them around 2018, but these palettes were huge. Everybody loved how cute they were, how concise they were. People again, Again, really bought into the whole collector's mentality of these. For their spring 2013 collection, they had the Boudoir Eyes palette, which again, I think was kind of a response to the Naked 2 palette that had come out, where it was kind of Too Faced's rebuttal to that, where they were coming out with something that was a little bit more cool toned, a little bit smokier, a little bit sexier. They were like kind of daring on that side. And also they put out a face palette called the No Makeup Makeup Face Palette, which again, during the time of 2013, this definitely was very in. We weren't really at that stage yet where we were seeing people do like harsh contours or tons of bronzer or really intense blush. And the makeup bubble, again, in 2013 really hadn't started growing yet. So it made sense that they were putting out makeup that was a little bit more basic and also more just competing with kind of the other top people in their category. Because really they were competing with the likes of like Urban Decay. It was almost like a game of tennis. <laughs> I feel like based on reading these blogs, especially because like everybody was comparing Urban Decay to Too Faced. I think those were just because they were kind of the two like it brands. So Urban Decay and Too Faced, it was kind of like they were in this tennis match where Urban Decay would come out with something that was really innovative and trend-setting E, and Too Faced would kind of hit back with their version of that. So you had the more edgy brand and you had the more cutesy brand. And I think they both really played into that while also still kind of making very similar products just with different aesthetics. Does that make sense? So this kind of rebrand was 
becoming very obvious of what they were going to be doing in the future, which was putting out more of these smaller, more concise, cute color stories, cute themes, tin palettes. And again, the 2013 holiday collection is kind of all over the place. They have this Joy to the Girls palette, which again, is every Too Faced palette you've ever seen. But then they also have this like phone themed palette. So it looks like kind of like an iPhone, but you flip it over and it's got like eye shadows and face makeup. They had all of these random bundles, including makeup they had already come out with. So they had all these lip bundles, mascara bundles. They had the A Few of My Favorites Thing palette, which this one I know was super, super hyped up and super huge. It was basically kind of that book-like packaging. So it opened like this and one side had a face palette and one side had an eyeshadow palette. Palette. And you also got all of these minis that came with this. I think that was the thing that Too Faced started doing this year was it wasn't you were just getting a palette. You were getting like everything. Bundles with lip products in them. You could get a lot of product for what at the time was kind of a reasonable price. Interestingly, they also did these sort of Be Merry and Be Bright face palettes, which had like six shadows and then either a blush or a bronzer or some type of face powder in them. And this really started a trend that they continued doing for a few years after that. They really started selling the whole mini palettes with face products included and putting them in sort of cutesy packaging together so you would kind of get the whole thing and they would play off of each other. They had a few other launches in 2013, but for the most part, those were like the big ones. And then we kind of got into 2014. 2014 is when I think the brand really started picking up in terms of what we know them as today. Their summer collection, for example, was super interesting. They had this Bonjour palette that was basically just a face palette, but it was huge. It came in again, that kind of tin packaging that you face became known for. And also along with that, they released more of these smaller, more concise nine pans. They have the a la mode palette, which uh, might I note the a la mode palette literally has three identical shades of white and then like a couple of neutrals. And that is the entire palette. I am floored that these were popular at the time, but like, I get it, you know. They also came out with their Natural Eyes palette, which definitely gave similar vibes to like the Boudoir eyeshadow palette. And then they also created one of their kind of tin palettes, but this time when you opened it instead of eyeshadows, it was a brow kit. And I can only assume that they created something like this, like this brow kit, because there was a demand for it. And I'm sorry if I seem like a broken record, but I feel like it's pretty important to point out that based on looking at all of their launches and when things came out, Too Faced is kind of the epitome of the supply meeting the demand. Like they saw a demand for something like brows. People wanted their to do their brows differently than they had been the past 10 years. Becoming more popular to like fill in your brows, make them a little bit thicker, do them a little bit more like harsh and Instagram browy. That was becoming a lot more popular. So Too Faced saw that demand and they created a product to meet that. A lot of makeup brands, like for example, Urban Decay or Anastasia, they were the ones that were creating the trend in the first place, whereas Too Faced definitely wasn't creating creating any trends, but they're doing a great job at keeping up with the trends as they happen. One place I will give credit to Too Faced is that I do feel they popularized the trend of really food-themed makeup. Their chocolate bar palette launched in 2014, which this was probably, arguably, one of their biggest palettes. This palette was huge. It was so hyped up. It was so popular. Every YouTuber had this palette. Every YouTuber is talking about this palette. Everybody wanted to buy this palette. It was an incredibly high hyped up. Not only just launch, but also the actual palette itself was really good. The formula for the time was fantastic. The price point was kind of ridiculously high, but there weren't a lot of competitors to Too Faced at that point, so that price point didn't seem that insane in 2014. And this is where I think Too Faced kind of made this sort of name for themselves. They weren't really creating any trends in the past few years. They were kind of just meeting the demand as it happened, but this created a trend. Doing food-themed makeup, doing scented makeup became something that Too Faced was known for. It kind of made them this sort of household name in the makeup industry. And I also think that the launch of the chocolate bar palette, whether this was intentional or not, I imagine not intentional because I don't think anybody could have anticipated sort of the boom of beauty YouTube that was about to happen, but also the rise of beauty YouTube and the release of the chocolate bar palette intersected perfectly. Everybody on YouTube who was doing makeup content was looking for those products that would grab attention, was looking for products that would be perfect in a thumbnail. And the chocolate bar palette really fit the bill. It was adorable. It smelled good. It looked cute in a thumbnail because it looked like a literal chocolate bar. And it was something that a lot of people were interested in and wanted to know about. So they turned to YouTube to look for reviews. They also launched bulletproof eyeliners, which I, I'm no, I wasn't like super noteworthy on that one. And they also launched another nine pan 
palette called the Cat Eyes palette, which again, I think was sort of the response to a trend. Also, their 2014 holiday collection, which was the What Pretty Girls Are Made Of and the, the Sugar and Spice palettes. Uh, I think they will speak for themselves. I'm not going to be too repetitive with the holiday palettes. Just know there's a ton of them. <laughs> a ridiculous amount of holiday palettes. And again, these ones were super, super hyped up. People were wanting to collect them. I specifically remember the What Pretty Girls Are Made Of palette being incredibly hyped up. I remember this being in everybody's makeup collection video in 2016. People were very proud that they got their hands on it. And that was the other thing about these palettes that I think is important to note is that they were kind of marketed as limited edition. Like Too Faced, once they saw sold out of these palettes. These didn't come back in stock after the fact. So I think that kind of added to this sort of craze around these holiday palettes. Not only were they seen as collectibles, but they were also seen as limited edition. And if you missed your shot, you missed your shot. I think now in 2020, we a lot of makeup consumers have the hindsight to be like, well, limited edition isn't real. But at the time, they were really legitimately li limited edition. And also, I think a lot of people definitely were falling into that hype about limited edition makeup. So 2014 kind of wrapped with more of the same. With the exception of the chocolate bar palette, I think the reason Too Faced stood out so much was because they were making makeup that was not only good, because the quality at the time was legitimately good, they were also making makeup that was adorable, that was cute, that was fun and trendy. I feel like as a brand they were sort of trailblazing in the sense that they were showing that makeup could be more than just makeup. It could be something that was like an experience for somebody. You could smell it. You could feel texture on packaging. Like you could do something that was a little bit different. And I think this is what helped the brand really, really stand out, especially during this time. Because if you think about it, because the YouTube makeup community was only just kind of starting to grow and the bubble was just starting to grow, there weren't a ton of competitors against what Too Faced was doing. So their price point, even though it was a little bit ridiculous, their price point seemed pretty reasonable considering they were making some such innovative, cool packaging, and making makeup an experience. That was kind of their whole gimmick and their whole thing. And this was very different from the 2010s when makeup just kind of existed to be functional. It existed to be put on your face. There weren't a lot of brands and companies making it to be collector's editions or making it to be marketable. Too Faced was definitely trailblazing in that category going into the late 20 teens. Now, if we're talking about this sort of YouTube bubble that was expanding, I think Too Faced popularity was expanding with that YouTube bubble. And I think the peak of that popularity happened in 2015 and 2016. 2015 was huge because number one, they launched their Love Flush blushes, which were kind of an instant hit. The fact that they were adorable and nostalgic and also had a great formula, people absolutely loved these blushes. I remember every collection video I watched, they would open their drawer and it would just be a row of Too Faced blushes. Like people were obsessed over these blushes, how adorable they were. And I think this also kind of shows Too Faced playing on more nostalgia because these were very reminiscent of like Polly Pocket. And I think a lot of people liked it because of that. And I think Too Faced definitely started to play into that more. Basically Too Faced with the start of the chocolate bar palette, they were basically making adult Claire's makeup. And I think the Love Flush blushes kind of prove that too. They were making Claire's makeup that was cool for 28 year olds to buy. And I think people really, really loved that at the time because people loved the whole cutesy, you know, aesthetic of it. It played on your nostalgia of playing with makeup, like toy makeup as a kid. Now you could have that toy makeup, but it was in real life and it was real makeup that you would use every single day. They also launched this palette, which I personally think is a really bad palette. But at the time, again, I remember a lot of people hyping this up. This was kind of in an era when it felt like Too Faced could do no wrong. None of their launches could be bad. Like this love palette, despite being kind of boring and kind of a silly concept, this was super hyped. People really, really loved loved it. The formula was really raved about. All of the blogs that I've read have said they adore this palette. They adore the consistency of the Too Faced formula. Um, and I think it's just interesting because I think this was them kind of trying to change it up a little bit. And while it seemed to work for them, they didn't necessarily go back to this aesthetic. So what I'm assuming happened is they put out like the chocolate bar and everybody went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over the chocolate bar palette. And then they launched this, which was another sort of bigger palette, a little bit larger. And people really didn't go as bananas. Like they're diehard fans who were like their supporters liked it, but everyday consumers weren't freaking out over it. So I think they kind of ditched this sort of idea and continued on with these larger tin palettes that we see more today even. 2015 was also really interesting because that's when Too Faced came out with their Born This Way foundation. 
collection, which again, I would consider kind of a staple from the brand. I mean, that's one of their most liked and well-received products even to this day. A lot of beauty gurus who really don't talk about Too Faced, they talk about the Too Faced Born This Way Foundation because it had a really solid formula that people enjoyed. And again, it was kind of their response to other brands coming out with these more full coverage foundations. This 2015 was kind of the era of caked face and like full coverage, matte, full beat. Like this is kind of the start of that. And I think Too Faced uh, Born This Way Foundation was a response to that trend happening. Also in response to kind of this new trend and wave of contouring and bronzing, they already have the chocolate bronzer that had come out. I believe it came out with the chocolate bar palette. They had a chocolate bronzer that was again another kind of staple in their collection. They also expanded that range and also came out with something called the Cocoa Contour, which again I think was their response to contouring and bronzing becoming really, really trendy and popular. They also continued to expand upon their range of nine pan palettes, which again fostered this sort of collectability about those palettes. Everybody wanted all of them. This was definitely when YouTube was kind of encouraging this sort of rampant consumerism and this rampant collecting, and I think Too Faced really played into that with these palette launches. I think that was smart of them, honestly. They really saw that people were willing to buy pretty much anything top YouTubers recommended them, and they saw that people were building up these collections like top YouTubers, and they played into that. They released things that were easy to collect. And on top of that, these nine pan palettes typically had very specific themes, specific color stories. They were easy to use, easy to work with, and they had a consistently good formula. The holiday 2015 Too Faced collection is easily my favorite. This one, they went balls to the wall. Like, they did not care. They went full on. They did the Paris collection. Okay, this Paris collection <laughs> came in a literal, like, box that looked like a little cafe in Paris, and it had these three palettes. One had a highlighter, one had a blush, one had a bronzer, and then it, they also had different themes of eyeshadow. This one is easily, despite the fact that this got horrible reviews, because it did, this was kind of the start of the cracks in the facade of Too Faced, because people who had gotten all of the holiday collections previously, the people who were collecting them, tried the formula and were basically like, hey, these are garbage. And the cracks in the facade of Too Faced started to show because people paid all of this money to buy this box that had three palettes and all of these minis and it looked like a Paris cafe and you could display it in your beauty room because it was the assumption that everybody had a beauty room even though <laughs> nobody did. The crazy thing was, despite the poor reviews, these sold out so quickly because people really had that collector's mentality. Despite this being kind of the start of poor formula quality in the Too Faced holiday collections, this is when people started pointing out that their consistency was a problem and that they were making their holiday palettes a different formula than their other nine pan palettes. Despite that, I personally think concept-wise, this was the coolest one they came out with. Like, I saw pictures of this and I was like, wow, this is actually kind of a moment. Like, I get why people were going bananas over this, because it's kind of cool. Like, I don't know, it's excessive and, like, a lot, but, like, given a lot of the stuff they give us now, this seems so innovative and cool compared to, like, the 2020 holiday collections, you know? 2015 was also a really interesting year because this is the year that the brand was in talks with Estee Lauder to be sold, and it turns out that in 2016, Too Faced was actually sold to Estee Lauder, who is, like, a parent company for a ton of different makeup brands. They were sold to Estee Lauder for 1.6 billion dollars. <laughs> billion. They had done, I believe, the year they sold, they had done 270 million in sales or something nutty like that. And it's actually interesting. I'll reflect on this a little bit more at the end, but it's very interesting because at the time, people felt like Jared in particular was being very silly for selling the company at this point in time because people felt like he was selling it right when the bubble around makeup and the hype around makeup was starting to grow. So people felt like it was really dumb of him to be selling selling it at this point in time because he could have made so much more money had he just stayed in like another five years and watched the bubble grow. However, if we see what happened with Too Faced after 2015, personally, I think Jared made the right decision selling what he did. Okay, 2016, the Peach Palette. 2016, the original Peach Palette launched. And something that's kind of interesting is the Peach Palette initially launched as its own 
individual thing. Like this was their kind of spring launch was just the peach palette. And it was a limited edition launch. And basically you either got it or you didn't. But it was so, so hyped up and so raved about that they decided that they were going to come back out with the peach palette. But this time it was going to be a whole peach collection. So we're going to talk more about the peach collection in 2017. But that's kind of the origins. Like when I say the peach palette, in 2016, this was purely just like the peach palette. And this was definitely one of their biggest launches of 2016. Another really notable launch for 2016 was the Too Faced and Nikki Tutorials collab. While Too Faced had done stuff with other people before this Nikki collection, this one was kind of the first one that really blew up in their faces. So they had the wild success of the Peach palette in 2016, but they also had this massive scandal surrounding the Nikki palette. Basically, Nikki Tutorials and Too Faced collaborated together on a palette called The Power of Makeup. It, it, there's kind of a backstory to it, but Nikki basically made this viral video. It's kind of how she got really big on the internet called The Power of Makeup where she did half of her side in full beat, half of her side bare, and just kind of talked about why she loved makeup. It was repeated by every YouTuber under the sun. It was a really, really hyped up popular video. And so Too Faced and Nikki decided to kind of use that hype and create this The Power of Makeup palette. Now, the issue with this palette was that Nikki, when she was promoting it, was like showing swatches of the palette and showing how the palette performed for her and showing how beautiful and pigmented the eyeshadow palettes were and was showing how easily they blended, showing how beautiful the face products were. Um, and the problem was that when people were actually getting their orders, when they were getting their palettes, the consistency of the palette was incredibly different than what Nikki Tutorials was showing. Now, looking back in hindsight, none of that was Nikki's fault. However, because Nikki's name was on the palette and because it was her fans buying the palette, this led to a large distrust in her as a person and a lot of hate headed towards her because people felt like she lied to them about the quality of this makeup because the quality was that bad. The palette was getting mass returned. There were a ton of drama videos made about it. Kind of at the center was Too Faced. And honestly, and I've noticed this as kind of a pattern with brand and influencer collaborations, there's a lot of times when a brand should absolutely be getting more of the hate, but the influencer does because they're kind of the face of that. It's kind of the risk you run when you do a collaboration as an influencer, I guess, is like you're going to be the one that gets the hate if it screws up. Because realistically, the problem lied with Too Faced. Their inconsistent formula was the problem. If you look at some blog posts that were made about this, the Power of Makeup palette, you can see people comparing it to the previous 2015 holiday collection, the Paris collection, where the formula was really patchy, difficult to blend, uh, dry, like had all of these issues. People were comparing those two formulas, saying, no, this is actually pretty similar. So what a lot of people started picking up on as a result of this was was that Too Faced kind of had two different formulas. They had their good formula and they had their limited edition formula. And I think this would have hurt them a lot more had this palette just been a very hyped up palette that wasn't an influencer collab. But because it was this influencer collab, they were able to shift a lot of blame to Nikki. And in turn, a lot of heat came off of them and a lot of people didn't really make that connection or like care that they as a brand really screwed up at that point. Now, of course, now in 2020, we know a lot of the shady stuff that happened been behind the scenes with this collaboration. Um, but at the time, nobody knew. Basically, what we found out in 2020 was that Nikki Tutorials only got paid like $50,000 flat to do this collaboration, which seems like a lot until you realize Too Faced probably made upwards of $5 million from selling these palettes. So they kind of took advantage of her as a newer influencer. They took advantage of her naivety um, and kind of exploited it to create these palettes, make a ton of money, and basically pay her nothing. So not only did Nikki not really get compensated for that palette the way that she fairly should have, not only that, but all of the blame for the faulty palettes definitely got pushed onto her and not onto Too Faced. Now, again, I think this would have been a bigger deal, but Too Faced was having like a rock star year. They came out with the peach palette. They came out with the chocolate bonbons palette. They came out with their first highlighter, which was the candlelit glow. They added a ton of new lip products, which got mixed reviews, but for the most part were pretty well liked. They added concealers to their born 
Born This Way range. So now you have the Born This Way concealers to pair with your Born This Way foundation. And also another kind of fan favorite product was the lip injection lip glosses. These were incredibly hyped up. And again, in my opinion, Too Faced at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this was kind of Too Faced's response to the trend of wanting to have bigger lips. Everybody wanted bigger, plumper, fuller lips. So in 2016, Too Faced saw that and they created a product to meet that demand. Now the holiday collections for 2016 were the Christmas in New York collection and also Grand Hotel Cafe collection, which had similar vibes. The palettes honestly looked very similar. <laughs> the products looked very similar. The bundles looked very similar. People were noticing again that the quality of the 2016 holiday stuff was very similar to that of the 2015 and the Nikki Tutorials palette. And people were starting to kind of even more put together this idea that Too Faced was an inconsistent brand and that they had different formulas for different launches. And I think 2016, despite these being very cool palettes, I think that this sort of was the end of the collector's mentality. I think a lot more people than we realized felt very burned by the 2015 palettes, that they kind of weren't interested, even though this was a cool concept and like it came with a little box again and it came with like a house. Even though it was cool, people just weren't as interested. I would also like to point out, and this is just kind of my conspiracy allegedly based on what I know about the YouTube community during this time, but I also think beginning of, so end of 2015, beginning of 2016 was kind of like peak consumerism for the beauty community. It was buy, 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 buy everything. You want this, you need this, you have to have this, I'm obsessed with this, this is everything. And then as 2016 wore on, we started to see this rise of the anti-beauty guru. We started to see anti-hauls. We started to see videos that were more critical of makeup. We started to see videos that were less review focused and more commentary on the makeup industry as a whole. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the rise of the anti-haul and kind of the fall of people wanting Too Faced holiday palettes, I don't think it's a coincidence those were at the same time. I really don't. I think that that definitely played a role. And I think that Too Faced was kind of the it girl of the YouTube community for a minute. But then slowly as the quality and consistency went down, turned into sort of the punching bag of YouTube. So by the beginning of 2017, Too Faced was definitely like the butt of every joke in most videos, specifically from smaller creators. I think this was made worse by the Better Together collection that Too Faced did as a collaboration with Kat Von D. This was so bad. The products themselves were like not good. The whole concept and like aesthetic and vibe was very weird. If anything, it made Too Faced look really bad because Kat Von D's, first of all, her whole side of the palette just looked better. The fact that she had like a pop of red and a black made her look so much cooler than Too Faced like weird <laughs> neutrals. Like it just looked better. It made her side look so much more aesthetically pleasing and cool. And everybody has said from that palette, the little heart that separated, most people have said they've kept the Kat Von D side and gotten rid of the Too Faced side because it was just boring. I kind of showcased how with Kat Von D, her brand kind of spoke for itself, whereas Too Faced had to really rely on these gimmicks. This palette, again, and this whole collection in general and this idea got roasted by a lot of makeup YouTubers, even really popular ones that had before really liked Too Faced. It got kind of roasted because it seemed like such a weird cash grab and also the concept just wasn't fully thought through. Like the fact that they as brand owners, and Jared wasn't even a brand owner at this point when this came out, his brand owners sat down and like wrote letters <laughs> to their consumers and made some of their products based on their animals and their pets as if the like, Jared was a celebrity, which he wasn't. Kat Von D to her credit had a following of her own, but Jared was nowhere near a celebrity. So making this entire sort of line based around him was just kind of a weird move. What kind of counteracted this was that at the beginning of 2017, Too Faced launched their peach palette collection thing. So they brought back the peach palette, they brought in this face palette, they brought in a couple of other like lip glosses, lip balms that went with this palette, and they kind of made the peach theme its own vibe, its own collection, its own thing. And at the time, again, this was pretty hyped up. The face palette got pretty bad reviews, but people really enjoyed the palette. And also, this launch was like heavily anticipated. People were waiting outside of Sephora's at midnight, the website crashed. I remember people were panicking because they couldn't get their hands on it and we thought at the time it was gonna be limited edition, so everybody was like panicking. This kind of counteracted the bad. So they had this really bad launch with the Better Together, but it was counteracted because they had this awesome launch with the Peach Palette. And I think this kind of trend of having kind of bad launches mixed 
mixed in with really good launches kind of sums up 2017 for Too Faced because they had the Hangover RX spray come out, which was a really cool spray. People really liked it. It was a continuation of an already existing product. Like that went well. But then they tried to do something a little bit new with the Natural Love palette, which was kind of their nine pan palettes theme. And that did horribly. It got really bad reviews. People really were not into it. It, it like people bought it when it first came out, but then were incredibly disappointed with the formula and felt like the price point was way too high. Then you have their liquid lipsticks come out, which get amazing reviews. People really love these liquid lipsticks. They feel like the formula is fantastic. It's very on trend. But then you have these highlighters come out, which are while they're shaped like a heart and they look adorable and they seem like they should be good, they get horrible reviews and people hate them. They barely have any glow to them. People feel like you have to scrape off the entire top layer to get even any form of pigment. So they were, again, now it wasn't just, oh, their holiday collections are kind of inconsistent. Now the brand as a whole was starting to build this reputation of having sort of inconsistent quality in their products, which again, kind of hurt them. This was even further proven in the end of 2017 when they launched their Peaches and Cream collection, which included the Just Peachy Max palette, which by and large was pretty raved about. But they also had a bunch of weird products that were not good. They had these sort of mix between powder and cream bronzers, blushes, and highlighters that didn't do well. They had this one bronzer that looked like a pie that people liked. It was okay. Then they had these other lip products that people really, really hated. And again, it just really seemed like every time they would put out something good, it was also met with something bad. And honestly, this inconsistency came at a very bad time because in 2017, this is when all of these new makeup brands are coming out. This is when ColourPop's becoming really popular. This is when brands that are way more affordable and way more consistent than Too Faced start popping up. So people are like, why would I spend $54 on a chocolate bar palette that may or may not have good quality when I could spend 10 on a palette that I know for a fact is going to be good? Despite having such a massive head start, being that they had been this brand, they had all this time and all these years to really work out a formula, really work out the kinks, despite that huge head start that they had, they were starting by the end of 2017 to be beaten out by brands that had started a lot later than them because for some reason, Too Faced just couldn't quite get its act together and come out with consistently good products. So now, because of this inconsistency, it kind of gave, especially YouTubers, ammunition to be like, hey, these palettes are gimmicks. That's really what Too Faced became known for in 2017 was it's a gimmick. Everything they do is a gimmick because you didn't know if it was going to be good or not, but you knew the packaging was going to be cutesy. And what is that? A gimmick. I also just have in my notes how the anti-haul ruined Too Faced and then just expand. I think that speaks for itself, frankly. I think anti-hauls and people starting to be smarter consumers and people trying to kind of say, hey, we're kind of sick of this rampant consumerism. We're sick of overconsumption. Let's tone it down. I think that that type of mindset really, really hurt Too Faced and their bottom line. I think nothing really proves that more than their 2017 holiday collection because they came out with a literal planner. A planner that had makeup. And when I tell you that this got roasted, it was roasted. I can barely find any reviews of this palette, but what I can find are people just ruthlessly mocking this palette. Because the idea that people would want to buy a like $60 planner that also had an eyeshadow palette in it was so absurd and just out of nowhere from them. But again, once you skipped one, you had no incentive to get the rest. So this really solidified people just being over their Christmas collections. And I'm sure I actually would put money on the Too Faced Lost Money on these planners because I saw like nobody buying them and this was the first time one of their holiday collections I remember those went on sale shortly after the holidays were over they couldn't get rid of them fast enough because not only was the price point just absurd but the actual concept was so strange and you knew that the eyeshadow palette formula was the same that it had been the last five years not only in formula but the color story was the exact same and they got pretty roasted for that now a couple of other notable things happened in 2017 that I think sort of contributed to this it wasn't just just anti hulls and people kind of starting to catch on to Too Faced's more gimmicky side. And it also wasn't even just them as a brand. Uh, they got in a feud, well, Jared Blandino got in a feud with Jeffree Star. Basically, Jared Blandino felt that Tarte had ripped off something that they made. I think it was one of their unicorn products. Um, Jared Blandino felt that Tarte had ripped off their brand, so he posted about it. And Jeffree Star basically called Jared Blandino out and was basically like, don't come for Tarte. Uh, you didn't invent unicorns. Shut up. And on top of that, Tati Westbrook, um, 
By the way, both of these people were like in the prime of their career in 2017. Tati Westbrook came out and made an anti-haul and basically dissed Two-Face, said that the owner was incredibly rude to her to party, basically said she wouldn't talk about them on her channel because of the horrible experience that she had with them. And that meant that Two-Face was now not only being covered negatively by like small YouTubers who felt like they were a gimmick, who felt like they represented everything about the makeup industry that sucked, not only were they kind of being targeted by them, now they're also being targeted by drama channels. Because when two major influencers publicly say that not only the brand is bad, but publicly say that the brand owner is bad, that leads to drama, that leads to speculation, that leads to people talking about it. So you now had two communities that were definitely emerging and becoming more popular, basically saying that don't buy from Too Faced. <laughs> we don't like Too Faced, we're not a fan of the brand. Like that was kind of the message that was being spread amongst these communities. And I did think this almost had not a trickle down effect because these were smaller channels talking about it, but I think it had a trickle up effect. I think that after Tati came out against her stance, after Jeffree Star talked about things, also I believe during that he alluded to something being going on with Nikki Tutorials where he kind of alluded that Nikki Tutorials got screwed over. After all of that kind of happened, you saw a decrease in larger YouTubers talking about Too Faced. It used to be every launch they came out with, every influencer had the big PR box on their stories talking about it. But after all of this happened, you saw kind of a decrease in that. They weren't exactly the golden girl of YouTubers anymore. I think 2018 was honestly a lot of damage control. Um, they started off by rebranding a lot of their kind of favorite products. So they rebranded the chocolate bronzers. They rebranded some of their nine pans. They kind of got rid of the nine pans and instead brought in this more, they were still nine pans, but they had like a much sleeker formula. They were a little bit more modern. You could tell they were trying to rebrand a lot of their classic stuff, like the stuff that people really love, consistently bought. And they made a really, really big deal about this rebrand, I think because they were still trying to rely on people who were like collectors of their products. But I don't think that this worked for them super well. I don't think people who had like a full chocolate bronzer ran out and bought this new one just because of a packaging change. This year was also a year where they had pretty much every launch they came out with just got absolutely roasted. Like they had the Life's a Festival palette, which would have been cool in 2016 when the whole unicorn rainbow trend was popping. But by 2018, everyone was over the gimmick. And again, it just played into this idea in everyone's brain that Too Faced was this gimmick. And then they also did their 20th birthday collection, which honestly, I'm not going to even re-explain that concept because I think that concept was so stupid and poorly done. And I roasted it when it came out because I was like, what is this? And it wasn't good. Nobody really liked it. It got, again, roasted by people. And on top of that, I think what really hurt them during this time was all of these products were so expensive. They couldn't keep up with the more competitive pricing of other brands that were coming forward. Not even just like brands like ColourPop, but drugstore brands were starting to step up their game and produce stuff that was way, way less expensive and had just as good of quality as Too Faced did and was frankly more consistent. I would argue one of their more um, hyped up launches from this year was the 2D Fruity collection. I do feel that this launch, it had mixed reviews, but I feel like out of all of the stuff they launched, the 2D Fruity collection was definitely the best received. Like people were like, okay, this is kind of fun. You're not doing like sweets, you're doing fruits. It's a little bit different, but it's still on brand. The palettes looked cute. The blushes were actually really good. The actual products seem to perform very well. But again, this was met with another downfall because then they put out that stupid Pretty Rich collection. Now again, this palette got roasted. People were like, what are you doing? This is the opposite of what we want. People were way more into like anti-consumerist, like not just buying things to be frivolous, not just buying things because they were pretty and cutesy. Like that was kind of the trend. And Too Faced was like, but do you want to be rich? <laughs> And what this Pretty Rich collection led to was more drama with Jared Blandino personally, because there was this cake that he had that basically said like rich lives matter or something along those lines. And this was during a time when Black Lives Matter was becoming a really prominent movement. It was a very tense time, I should say. Um, and for him to make have this cake that says rich lives matter and to be posing and smiling with this cake and to post it on his Instagram, he got really roasted for this. Even though he technically was the owner anymore. He was still affiliated with Too Faced as a brand. He was very much the brand. Like he had set that up for himself, that he was a prominent figure of Too Faced even after he sold the company. And I think this cake rightfully pissed a lot of people off because you have this, you know, rich man sitting in his mansion profiting billions of dollars off of a makeup company that is seemingly more and more inconsistent and vapid and putting out all of this cutesy makeup just to distract from the fact that the 
actual formula wasn't good. I'm always a little bit skeptical of like, oh, the internet is the reason that a brand kind of fell off. I'm always skeptical to say that because frankly, like I know there are so many makeup consumers who have never watched, they don't even know who James Charles is. Like they've never watched beauty YouTube in their life. However, I think there is a really sizable chunk of people who consume makeup content on YouTube and are also makeup consumers. I think that's not a small number anymore. Like that's a very large percentage of makeup consumers are people who also watch makeup on YouTube. So I do think that Jared constantly being in this drama, the cake situation, constant anti-hauling of their products, the constant joking of their products, the constant reputation that they had of not being consistent. I do think that all of this accumulated together and by the end of 2018, I think it was really hurting them financially. I think their sales were absolutely down because the internet's opinion of them was so poor by the end of 2018. To be fair to them, they did end the year on somewhat of a high note where they did this gingerbread spice palette, which was kind of relying on the formula of the Too Faced, you know, chocolate bar palettes, the sweet peach palettes. They kind of relied on that and created a holiday themed palette around that concept. So it was a bigger tin palette. It had a really good formula. It was consistent. And while they still had their random little holiday releases that all look the same and had bundles, this palette in particular kind of shined for them. And it goes along with this, again, this two-faced mantra of it's something good, something bad, something good, something bad. That's how it's been for the past like four years of the brand. I think by 2019, Too Faced was also really struggling with their identity, which they had been for a while. Too Faced really could not decide from the get if they were going to be a more X-rated brand and more like really sexy, like the boudoir eyes and the low job mask and this like what was the uh the pat the puss highlighter that they came out with they had all of those and they couldn't decide if they were going to do that or if they were going to be like claire's makeup <laughs> like love flush blushes and natural lust and really cutesy peach palettes like their literal mascot was a freaking cartoon peach like they couldn't decide and i think that that again was starting to hurt them because the brand as a whole didn't necessarily have this clear vision and clear aesthetic the way that it did at its peak in 2015 they had a few launches in 2019. They had the Natural Lust, they had the Ice Cream Highlighter Palette, they had the Pineapple Collection that they came out with, and honestly all of them for the most part really turned into jokes. It was kind of a joke on the internet about like what Too Faced put out now. Nothing seemed trendy, nothing seemed to be meeting the trends, nothing seemed to be meeting the market, what the market was demanding, the way that they had been. And even for Christmas 2019, they had this great Christmas palette from 2018, and they decided in 2019 19 to just do the same thing but like add a pop of blue. So it was like wow you couldn't even build off of the one cool idea you've had in the last two years. I think their reputation at this point was just so tainted that I think almost they as a brand started to give up by 2019. Like I think they stopped putting a lot of thought and you know effort into their releases. I think they realized if people weren't going to buy it anyway what was the point of trying to put out these amazingly innovative cool palettes, trying to meet the demand, trying to put out good formulas, trying to lower price points, I think they kind of gave up a little bit. And that kind of brings us to 2020, where we are now. I mean, I God, I don't even remember what the brand put out this year, frankly. Like, I don't even know. I'll put some pictures up. I don't even know what the brand put out in 2020. Like, what did they even launch? The only thing I remember about Too Faced from 2020 is that, yet again, they were in some drama. Um, when Nikki Tutorials came out as transgender, Jared Blandino's sister basically changed her Instagram bio to say, transgender, huh? That's not the only thing she's lying about. And of course, that was incredibly not only insensitive, but also promoting, there's so much wrong with that. We don't even need to get, we don't need to get into it, but there's so much wrong with that. <laughs> I talked about it at the time. I've talked about it in other videos, a lot wrong with that. And Jared, while he took, you know, quick actions in firing his sister from the company, for a lot of people that wasn't enough because this is again, just like the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, you remember the cake, you remember him getting called out by other people for being rude. It also brought to light a lot of the shady stuff that happened with Nikki deal to begin with. This is kind of when we learned about how she only got paid $50,000 for something that made Too Faced millions. The whole thing was really a lot and I think it was kind of a breaking point for a lot of people. A lot of people I know after this happened stopped supporting the brand and I think that led to a lot of lackluster launches in 2020. I really cannot think besides the little six pans that they're now coming out with that are little tins that are you know pretty popular and seem very cute and concise and on trend. Besides those I can't really think of a lot of stuff that came out this year that people were raving about from Too Faced. And I think that kind of leads me to my final thoughts, right? 
I think there's a lot of problems with Too Faced. I think the, after looking at their entire history from the last eight years, I think there's a lot of things they could improve on. First of all, they put out way too much. They're putting out way too much random crap. They're putting out way too much stuff. Nothing is consistent. The brand as a whole is just all over the place. You don't know if one week you're going to get like a cutesy little peach or the next you're going to get like boobs. Like you have no idea where the brand is going. They're kind of in this weird identity crisis where nothing feels consistent with them. And again, I think a big problem is they just can't keep up with the current market. They cannot keep up with these new brands coming in and making adorable makeup for a way cheaper price. They thrived so heavily in the early 2000s and the early teens. They thrived so heavily because they were the only ones doing what they were doing. And the second they got any sort of competition, they completely folded. I think had Too Faced been this like trend setting brand from the get, this might have been a little bit different, but they weren't. They were largely, besides their kind of packaging and aesthetic becoming trendy. They were meeting the demand that people put forward. They weren't exactly creating the trends. And eventually, as it happens with a lot of brands, when you're meeting the demand, you start to fall behind on the trends because you can't keep up with everything that quickly. I think while Too Faced has definitely lost its sort of magic, like people are not hyped about their new releases anymore. They rarely come out with products that get people excited. I think while they've definitely lost their magic, I think they're going to continue on and be okay as a brand. And I think that's largely because they've built up somewhat of a following with their sort of basics that they came out with. So they're always going to have people buying the Born This Way foundation. They're always going to have people that want to rebuy the chocolate bronzer. They're always going to have people that are going to love the peach palette or the peachy mattes palette. Because they had some very consistently good palettes that became very, very popular, I think they're always going to kind of thrive off of selling those products. But I think moving forward, they're going to have to completely rebrand and completely redo and restructure their entire company to move forward successfully, to move forward in a way that gets people to trust them again. Because that's the problem. They've lost a lot of people's trust, not only trust in, you know, Jared as a person, but they've lost a lot of people's trust in is the quality of these products actually going to be good. I think if they had just continued to put out less products that were better thought out, they would have never run into this problem. I think they would have been dominating. But it's very clear that they kind of sold out for the cash grab and sold out to make quick money because they thought that they were like untouchable. They thought they were the top of the top, the best of the best. They thought they were going to be the number one brand forever. But they kind of stopped trying and sold out, not really thinking about the ramifications that would have from their clientele, like not thinking about the fact that people would view them as very inconsistent. I don't think they foresaw all of these new brands coming in and like taking the spotlight from them. And I think that that lack of ability to think ahead really, really screwed them over. And that is kind of the evolution of Too Faced. Man, close the laptop. That was a lot. Anyway, hope you guys like this video. Please go check out Elle's video if you haven't, if you want to know kind of like the origins of Too Faced. I'm sure she did an amazing job explaining all of that. Um, and yeah, Merry Christmas Eve, by the way. I hope I made your Christmas. I know I'm spending Christmas Eve not with my family, just well, my, Char my Charles, my Charles. <laughs> Charles and my dogs, but not with like my, you know, not with like my close family. We're doing Zoom on Christmas for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And I know it's gonna be really hard. And I know I'm gonna be watching a lot of my favorite YouTubers to make me feel a little less alone. So I hope that this video maybe made you feel a little less alone if you're spending the holidays alone this year because of COVID or for any reason. I love you guys so much. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please like and subscribe or just like or just subscribe or do neither. Honestly, just so happy you're watching me. Thank you so much for being here. My merch, including my Glomus merch, my social media and everything I'm wearing on my face will be linked down below along with links and information to the Georgia Senate runoff races that are happening on January 5th. Early voting has started. It's super important. Stay informed, stay involved. I love you guys so much and I will see you in the next one. Bye!